I'm going to try to talk to you about um, how HTTP2 can affect image delivery today. So first things first, um, you've already heard this a couple of times by now, I guess. Um, the O'Reilly folks were really, really kind and provided a lot of the assets that you need to run today's test um, off, offline. So you can get you go to that IP and get all the assets that you need to do the tests that I'm going to show you today. Um, and don't strain the Wi-Fi too much with that. That's really nice. Um, secondly, uh, please, please, please rate the sessions you attend. Um, I've put a uh, link for my session down there in this is good URL, Velocity H2 image feedback. Um, you can also rate all the sessions on the Velocity app. So please uh, take this minute and rate the session you've, you've attended and help me become better at my job. <laughs> Thank you. Also, if you have feedback or questions later, hit me up on Twitter or via email. I am... Uh, I'm known to have long communications on Twitter regarding image optimization, so don't, uh, don't hold back on asking questions later if you come up with any. All right, so Steve already mentioned I'm working for a company called Akamai, and I'm part of a, um, of a team that's called Advanced Solution Services. And when that team was invented, we thought, well, that's a pretty cool name because it sums up all the stuff that really doesn't fit into a, any kind of product category, category at Akamai. But later we found out when people started to talk to us in email communication that they abbreviated ASS. So um, <laughs> now whenever a new prospector comes in, it's a job for the ass. So that's us. That's kind of embarrassing. Um, despite, that, despite that name, it's actually a cool job to have because Steve already said this. I'm, I'm in, this, in this nice position to be able to do some research every now and again. And uh, the last couple of months I spent researching how image optimization can uh, help um, the speed index, especially in the context of HTTP2. Um, before that, I've dabbled with image uh, compression algorithms and helped out a little bit uh, with mods JPEG and stuff. So today I want to talk to you about how you can make your images on your websites show faster and how you can make them show faster with only about 25% of their data being sent over the wire so you might call that, well, Tobias, you're a snake oil salesman. Obviously, this is impossible to do. But before you boom me off the stage, maybe let me show you some data. Um, this is Steve's HTTP archive. Um, and it shows us that we have a problem. And the problem is images. Um, images currently make up about 64% of, of all our website assets. And JPEGs being the lion's share of almost 50% of that. And images have a very high correlation, therefore, for to page load time, obviously, but also to the speed index, because without an image, a website looks incomplete. Um, also, we have a devastating trend, and that is images are growing bigger. So the number of images on a website on average stays pretty much the same, but images are currently growing about 200 kilobytes per year. We might argue that it's HDBI displays um, and... Uh, the higher display devices that we carry around with in our pockets now. But it's also currently the hero image trend where we have large images at the top of our, of our websites to convey emotion and evoke, evoke emotional responses. So curious monkeys that we are, what can we, what can we learn? What can we do? What can we investigate to find out, to, to, to find out what to do with that problem? So first of all, I think we should tackle image compression because that's an important piece of the puzzle. And secondly, we should investigate HTTP2. So these are the two very, very large concepts I want to talk to you today. So first of all, image compression. Um, I've been doing research about this for two years before I came up with the idea of researching HTTP2. And I, came, I ended up finding out that Mods JPEG is the, core, the best JPEG encoder that we currently have on the planet. So if you, if you want to compress JPEGs, there are lots of JPEG encoders out there with the standard lib JPEG, um, JPEG Optim, um, there's JPEG Tron and JPEG Rescan. But in all my tests, and I've done tests with 700,000 and a million JPEGs, um, I found out that Mods JPEG actually encodes JPEGs most optimally. That is because it has a couple of features that no other JPEG encoder has. For example, it optimizes Huffman tables as good as any other tool. So it actually makes tools like JPEG Rescan and JPEG Optim completely redundant. Um, it uh, supports custom quantization matrices, which basically just means it incorporates pattern or you know, ideas about JPEG optimization that 
uh, were until very recently patented, but have now been open sourced because the patent has expired and are now already part of Mods JPEG. No other JPEG encoder has done that so far. Um, also, no other JPEG encoder ships trellis quantization, which makes your JPEGs even smaller. And um, it supports optimized progressive encoding, into which we will get today. So that means your progressively encoded JPEGs will be smaller than on any other JPEG encoder. So Mods JPEG for the win. And best of all, Job Mods JPEG is uh, able to do that with a minimal negative impact on the SM score. SSIM score. SSIM score, anybody? No? Okay. SSIM means the structural similarity index. That means how different a picture is between an input image and an output image. And let's regard this holiday photo of a much younger Tobias um, on an island eating a flower. And now let's look how that image would look as a map if I compressed it. The red pixels in here are the pixels that got affected by my JPEG encoding process. And this is actually a number we can measure. In this case, we are using DSSIM for that. And the number for this picture, for this test picture would be 0.13% of visual difference. That's what DSSIM has measured here. Um, so having this kind of quality control tool for a JPEG enables us to automate JPEG quality compression. Now, if we wanted to find out how much we can read, how much we can modify an image before the human eye might pick it up, the current threshold is about 1.5% of visual difference. That should be something that the normal human eye cannot pick up. So, as I said, we should probably automate this. And to automate this, I created a demo script that's called CJPEG DSIM. CJPEG DSIM just automates the process of finding an optimal JPEG quality uh, using the structural similarity index. I'm going to demo that in a second. So, it's just a, oh, hold on. It's just a binary search, basically, that tries to find the optimal, optimal JPEG quality for a difference of 1.5%. So this slide, you're going to see a lot today. This is the live action demo side, which basically is supposed to, to remind me that I'm going to live demo something. I'm going to try to live demo eight times today. So if something breaks, this, ha this had to be expected. OK, so first of all, let me introduce you to input.jpg. Input.jpg is, is one of the demo files I'm using today. Input.jpg is a photo of the River Rhine running across the beautiful town Düsseldorf, Germany, where I come from. And I'm going to use that to demo some compression techniques that I just mentioned. So first of all, um, image.jpg, uh, input.jpg is currently, hold on, there it is, 113 kilobytes of size. And um, we might ask ourselves, what kind of JPEG quality has that thing? So I'm using um, Image Magix Identify to uh, read that metric out. Um, you know that JPEG quality is usually a value between 0 and 100. Everybody's aware of that? Cool. So according to the Image Magix Identify, we have a JPEG quality of 86. Does that tell us anything? No. JPEG quality is a completely void metric. Um, what, this, what this means in this case is probably that the encoder, I'm guessing this must have been Photoshop, um, has now set this at, oh no, it was the GIMP, um, has set this on a quality of 86. But since every JPEG encoder on the planet does something differently under the hood, that whole JPEG quality integer from 0 to 100 doesn't really mean anything in terms of comparability, which is kind of bad. But here we go. It's the, it's the one thing that we, uh, that we have to read out right now. So if I want to show you that Mods JPEG is actually doing a better job than the JPEG encoder that was used in the GIMP, I'm going to demo this using, the, using Mods JPEG on the command line. So, uh, oh, hold on. I actually got that noted down for me, so I don't forget how it's done. JPEG quality, Mods JPEG quality. Okay, here we go. So we've read that it's a quality of 86, so for argument's sake, although we know that this metric is actually void, I'm going to say that the quality here for mods JPEG output is also 86. And I'm going to create an output file I'm calling output mods JPEG Q86 because I'm creative that way. All right. And now we have a output file, and it's significantly smaller, 95K right now. That's pretty, pretty neat. How did mods JPEG do this? Well, it did this by all the kinds of optimizations that I talked to you about. Um, it is uh, 
it is much more efficient than the libjpeg we've seen on the GIMP. So this file is now much, much smaller. That's, uh, that's already a quite a nice win. But uh, hold on, here, yeah, let's find out how much, how much visual differences we occurred with this kind of compression because I don't want to create visual artifacts, right? I want to make sure that my image after compression, after shaving off more than 20K, still looks okay. So now I'm going to measure with the DSSIM how much difference I've gotten here. And I'm doing this with this little script that goes around DSIM. Um, I'm calling DSIM wrapper because DSSIM only works on PNGs. So DS DSSIM wrapper here on the command line just creates a temporary PNG measures and tells me the output. So it's really no magic here. And here we get this nice number that tells us how much visual difference occurs. And it's, it's read from a, a number from zero to one and um, one meaning 100% of difference. So basically everything after the dot is, uh, sing is percentages. So what we are seeing here is that we have created a visual difference of 0.9%. That's really nothing, right? Oh, 0.09% I'm seeing, yeah, 0.09%. It's even less, it's really, really nice, which means we could probably up the compression, right, without actually destroying the image and uh, get an even smaller file. So um, for that, I'm going to run that tool I'm going to talk to you about, CJPEG DSIM, because that should automate that for me. So CJPEG DSIM would look like this. I'm just telling it the encoder to use, mods JPEG, and I'm giving it the input image. Now it's going to create a binary search to find the perfect quality metric and hopefully create a much, much smaller file. And here it is, input CJPEG DSIM, and look at that, 46 kilobytes. That's super, super, super small, right? That's, uh, what is that, 60% win of over the original input? Now, let's see how much visual difference we created with this, because maybe that it means that I've destroyed the image, that it now looks terrible, so let's find that out. Let's compare the input image to the image that I've created on CJPEG, well, CJPEG DSIM. And here we find out that the visual difference is still only 0.6%, so completely acceptable. Um, if you want to see this visually, which I totally encourage you to do, we can now look at the images. So this, yeah, this is input image, completely without any compression. And this, hold on, check is the CJPEG DSIM. Let me go back and forth a couple of times. And you can see that there has, if you pay close attention to the high contrast areas, especially to the trees, you'll see that there is some lossiness in this. So we have lost visual information, of course. The, the major bite size savings have to come from somewhere. But um, they are so minute that the normal viewer will probably not uh, notice them at first sight, especially not if he only has, or if they only have one image to, to look upon instead of comparing image A to image B. So this is actually something we can use to make images much, much, much smaller. So, and now last but not least, one of the things that I haven't mentioned is one of the things that Mods JPEG does to create these super small images um, is in, in unlike the uh, input image, it creates progressive images. So um, to test if an image is progressive, I am using Image Magix Identifier again. Yeah, here we go, verbose. And. This is image magic's identify and I'm grabbing for the string that says interlaced non or uh, JPEG. If it says non, it means that the JPEG has not been encoded progressively. Now, if I'm gonna run this on output JPEG, which has been created by mods JPEG. Oh, sorry. Ah, ah, I renamed it. Yes, of course. There we go. It tells us interlaced JPEG. That means that this image is progressive. Now, what does progressive encoding mean? Let's 
let me tell you about progressive encoding because this is what's really, really important for how we can optimize image delivery for HTTP 2. So everything so far has been common image delivery, image compression. And now we're gonna talk about what makes this special of image delivery. On the left-hand side, you see a sequentially encoded JPEG like input.jpg that we've seen so far. It loads with the window blind effect we might know from very, very slow internet connections or from modem times if we're old enough to remember those. Sequential JPEGs load from top to bottom in this window blind effect, or I've also seen this depending on the browser. They don't show at all until the entire image has been downloaded and then suddenly pop into existence. Progressive JPEGs, on the other hand, you see this on the left-hand side, um, start with a very, very, very pixelated preview image, the first scan layer, and then the image quality gets better and better and better in steps until the image is there in all its full D glory. Um, the nice thing about that is that that initial image layer is faster to, sh to render than the sequential one. So the browser already knows what to do. So the uh, important term to take away from this is scans or the scan layers. This is again the photo of the Ryan and I've compiled it from three different scan layers. On the very far left you'll see scan layer number one in the middle where the word scans is, it's scan layer number five. And on the right, it's scan layer number 10. You can only tell the difference between five and 10 by the color of the grass, I guess. So default scan, uh, sorry, default progressive JPEGs have 10 of these scan layers. So from a very pixelated preview to the full HD glory. As you can see in this preview, number one is actually grayscale because the JPEG encoder tried to make the image as small as possible and disregarded some of the color information to get there. The second scan layer shows a purple rhine, which is weird. Purple rhine is not really how the rhine looks most of the year. And then the image quality gets better and better and better until we arrive at scan layer number 10. And how does the JPEG encoder do that? This is the default script the JPEG encoder follows when it's creating these 10 scan layers. As you can see, the uncommented lines are 10, if you count them. One, two, three, four, five, 10. It's very nice. And it tells the JPEG encoder how to ship image information per scan layer. And I've highlighted what it does in detail because it's kind of complex to read. So for, um, to understand what that script does is um, you need to know that JPEG ships three different kinds of, um, of color channels, so brightness and two color channels. And it has this eight by eight block matrix in which it encodes its images. And eight by eight, so eight, eight multiplied by eight makes 64. So we have an index in the green, highlighted in the green, um, from zero to 63, um, which tells the JPEG encoder which pixels to send at which step. So at the very first line, for example, we see zero, one, two, which means please send brightness info, send information from both the brightness channel and both color channels. And then it tells, uh, in the green circle, it tells us to only send information over the first pixel because the first pixel is called uh, the direct current which manipulates all the other currents. Here you can see the different color channels that I told you about. In the left hand, the left top, it's the complete image. In the bottom, it's the, only the brightness channel, then the uh, blue channel and the red channel. And those are, these are the terms that they are called in JPEG. So the original image, uh, y, C, B for the blue channel and CR for the red channel. And this is that direct current thing that I just mentioned. So this is an eight by eight JPEG matrix and the direct current is the very, very first indice, indice, yeah, that's the correct term, indice. And then we have 60, um, 63 remaining numbers that need to be shipped. And the, the JPEG encoder works them off in a zigzag order. So it doesn't go line by line, it works in a zigzag order. So. And um, the nice thing about this is we can manipulate that. And that's gonna be very, very important for what I'm gonna show you. We, because that, let me go back a couple. That default scan script here is basically just plain text. And it can be, uh, it can be sent to the JPEG encoder with, uh, on the command line. Where, and then I thought, well, who says we need to ship the default values? Maybe we can ship different values. So I started experimenting with this and came up with that idea. Because I thought maybe we need less scan layers with more color information instead of grayscale Rhine and purple Rhine. So I created this script. And this script basically says, 
send, uh, again, send color information from all three channels in the first one, but then send far more information on the second and the third run. So the second run, number two here is important, and then the third and the fourth just supplement the information that has been sent with the second and the fifth is basically just rounding things off. So with that modification, I'm sending far more information per scan layer. Okay, it's live action time again. This has all been very, very boring, I guess, but it's gonna be much more interesting if we do this live because then you can actually see what I'm doing here. So, um, to, to do which one am I gonna execute first? Yeah. We're gonna jump ahead a little because we already created those. So now we have, like, remember that I said that mods JPEG encodes its image progressively? So we have already have output mods JPEG Q86 there. So I'm using a tool that's called JSK, which uh, is a short for JPEG scan killer. Dangerous name, but it's actually simple and cute. And what JPEG scan killer does it, is it just scans the JPEG file for that fingerprint, a hex fingerprint, that uh, denotes that a new scan layer is starting and then splits them apart into separate images so that human visitors, human, human viewers can view them because otherwise you would have no idea what's inside a scans file. So we now have scans here. This is scan layer number one of that Rhine image that I showed you. And then scan layer number two, the purple Rhine. And then it gets a little better and a little better and a little better now the, now the meadow looks a little weird, but the rest of the image is pretty okay. We're at layer number eight now. See, and layer number eight finally ships that, that green for the meadow. Layer number seven still doesn't have it. Layer number eight does. And then the, with layers number nine and 10, we just update the information to make it a little better. So we have 10 different scan layers for this that supplement the, in, the information step by step. And now, I have here in my magic, bo magic toolbox these two scripts that I showed you. The scans default. Let me. Ch -ch -ch -ch. Right, that's the default script that we, uh, the JPEG encoder uses to create scan, uh, st 10 scan files. And I have here the scans file that I created with five scans. That's this one here. And now I'm gonna just quickly delete the scan files so that we can have a look at them again when I recreate them. All right. I'll back all the way now and. Now I'm supplementing mods JPEG's encoding command with that scans flag scans and then scans custom.txt to tell the JPEG encoder to not use the default settings, but to use my custom settings. Here we are. Um, it's called output mods JPEG custom scans and you can see that it's, uh, oh yeah. Hey. Um, it's a little bigger than expected, but that's because I'm shipping different scan layers than the default JPEG encoder, but it's an insignificant gain in comparison to what the default scans file would do. Now let's split those apart again and have a look at them and to compare them to the 10 scan files that we just saw. Custom scans and split them apart. And here we are, we now have five scan files only. And now this is the first scan layer. And ta-da, we have color information suddenly. That's pretty nice. We're not having a grayscale Ryan in the first scan layer anymore. And now comes the big surprise. This is already scan layer number two. So within two scan layers, I managed to ship both color information and I've managed to ship enough detailed information that the image looks almost okay. Now with the ne next two scan layers, I only ship a little bit more color information, scan layer number three and four. And the difference between scan layer number four and five is not visible to the human eye anymore. That's just rounding basically. So after two scan layers, we have an image that looks okay-ish. And then in the next couple of scans, four, three and four, we ship the rest of the color information and are done. This comes, of course, at a cost of a little more file size, but this will be completely outweighed by how, J, how uh, HTTP2 is gonna handle this. Let's see if I forgot to tell you about anything. 
No. By the way, um, I've put all the commands I'm showing on the command line into the slide deck. The slide deck is already available on speaker deck, and um, O'Reilly is also going to publish it. So if you want to have a look at the command line options that I'm um, demoing here, you can find them in the slide deck. So now I've talked a lot, a lot, a lot about how to encode images optimally. But now comes the actual interesting bit. How does HTTP2 affect this encoding? Because HTTP2 has a huge impact on how it deals with these scan layers, and I want to show you about that. So this is the nice, de the nice difference between HTTP1 and HTTP2. HTTP1 is the bland stuff that we know from the past. HTTP2 is really, really tasty, good, and brings all the goodiness in one big bite. Um, in more technical terms, this is the difference, this is one of the major differences between HTTP1 and HTTP2. HTTP1 has this continuous stream of so of request and response, request and response, and HTTP2 has a, something that is called multiplexing, which means all the requests at once. This is um, how web page test would uh, show the difference between that. This is a demo site we're going to see in more detail today, and we see on the left-hand side HTTP1 with um, Chrome, with six simultaneous connections and a to to completely boring traditional waterfall diagram. And on the right-hand side, we see the same website, but this time with HTTP2. And we see that all connections start in the same time. HTTP2 can do much, much more than that. It can, for example, do resource prioritization. That means it can tell the browser, or the browser can try to tell the server, and the server might tell the, that this is true. It's a little complicated. Um, that a certain asset for a website is more important than another asset. This is going to be quite crucial for one of the demos I'm going to show. And this is how HTTP2 looks under the hood. The, we have streams that ship our data. These streams have headers. And after the headers, we have maybe flex about the priority and then the actual data. These are the HTTP2 streams. And in these headers that I mentioned, we also have pretty cool optimizations. For example, we have compression of the headers, which also benefits JPEG encoding and JPEG uh, delivery. So these headers, which were plain text in HTTP1, become uh, uh, binary encoded and Huffman optimized in HTTP2. Um, one last thing before we have a look, a, a first live demo of this. Um, I think Steve already mentioned this. HTTP2 sometimes has that thing that people turn it on and then they find out, hey, actually, this doesn't work as well as I expected. And one of the reasons for this is the initial congestion window. We need to tune the initial congestion window for HTTP2 differently from with the way we needed to tune it for HTTP1. The reason is that in HTTP1, uh, we had, like I showed you with Chrome, up to six simultaneous connections, and each of, that connect or each of those connections benefited from that initial congestion window setting. In HTTP2, we only have a single stream, and that single stream is the only resource that gets the initial congestion window. I'm going to demo more about the initial congestion window live, I hope. So there was a lot of dry detail about how HTTP2 works. Now you might ask yourself, how much benefit do I actually get from that? How much can I reap if I turn that on? And before I answer that, I want to, I want to go into how do we actually measure that? And my, uh, top num my top metric for today is the speed index, because this is, Steve said this in the introduction, um, how a user might perceive the, in the site. This, the, the initial uh, site performance. So I'm going to measure my, uh, my updates about um, how well progressive JPEGs deliver over HTTP2 by, by, by using the speed index. So how does the speed index work? This is all taken from Pat Neiman's demonstration of how the speed index works. It's completely false stuff. We have two um, websites, one that, uh, so both of them load in 12 seconds, but one manages to render quite fast and only has a little rendering debt at the end, while the other one takes a very, very long time to show anything to the user. These are basically what the two graphs here tell you. So we can basically say that the website that is here colored red has a rendering debt. It doesn't show significant information to the user in an appropriate amount of time. So in terms of speed index, that would mean that the uh, blue site has a very low speed, speed index, um, and the right-hand side, which has that rendering debt, has a very high speed index. So the higher the speed index, the worse the site is perceived by your users. And uh, to sum this example up, in uh, blue side to red side, we have a 
uh, speed index difference of 7.5, uh, 7.4 percent. So it's a it's a huge difference between how the uh, how the user perceives the site because as we said we they both end up loading in 12 seconds at the page load event, but the left hand side is perceived much much faster. All right, so live demo live demo time again. So the first thing I want to demo to you today I'm going to start very very slowly, is I'm going to create some baselines. Baseline number one is sequential JPEGs, that window blind effect JPEG that I showed you, versus the progressive JPEGs with the pixelation, and not on HTTP2 yet, no on HTTP1, because I want you to see the difference when we switch to HTTP2. So let's demo that. And to demo that, we're gonna, I'm so happy that I have stable internet connection. Um, we're gonna be using a demo website that I've set up. The demo website, running on Tobias.is, that's just my domain, um, has basically no significant CSS, just a bit of Flexbox layout. It's all inline. It also ha doesn't have any external calls, no JavaScript. So it's basically just a framework to load images. This is the demo website HTML code. And that's what I'm gonna, that's what I'm gonna load today to see uh, how well HTTP 1 is doing for sequential versus, ba versus baseline prog uh, only progressive. Chip. So this is a URL for the sequential JPEGs that I've created. And I'm gonna be using this, so the server is located in Dusseldorf and the next test agent that I have available here is Frankfurt, it's a um, web page test private instance. And I'm gonna be using Chrome, I'm gonna be using three tests and uh, cable connection and I'm only gonna render First view, nothing fancy here. And let's kick off the other test in the same time. So that we don't have to wait for the results so long. Oh, okay, that takes longer than expected. I'm only running three tests, so we don't have to wait for nine tests to complete. I usually do nine tests on web page test. But uh, yeah, forgive me that this is not really statist statistically significant, but I hope we will get pro probably prob uh, really usable results. So here we go, first run number one. And this one's almost done too. So sequential JPEGs on HTTP 1. Um, we are shipping 1.6 megabytes of JPEG data because this is about the, si the size of our images according to J HTTP archive. And we're having 20 JPEG requests and the one HTML request, as you can see here. And here's that waterfall diagram that I told you about. And now, progressive. And we can see that here's the speed index of that one speed index of 1,900, and here we have a speed index of 1,760. And I'm gonna hopefully be able, yes I am. Does it pick the right ones? No, it does not. Ah, okay, that's interesting. I'm not sure why it doesn't allow me to pick the other test. Steve, do you know? Should be finished. Okay, I can't seem to compare these tests to each other. For the second one? No, that's it, I forgot to set the video flag, haven't I? Yeah, that's, that's me, damn it. Oh no, I set a video flag. Anyway, um, so I wanted to show you visual graphs for that and I have actually created them here. Hold on, no, yes, here we go. Um, but I managed to botch it in the live demo, that's live demos for you. So here we have the visual graphs. Um, so what I've tested here is um, baseline sequential versus progressive JPEGs, and I've tested them on both Firefox and Chrome. And we can see here that the visual pro pro progress graph for this is a little better for progressive JPEGs versus sequential JPEGs, but not by much. So we're talking about a wind of about 100 milliseconds, 150 milliseconds for that. So progressive JPEGs do a little better in terms of speed index on HTTP 1, but they're not doing that much better. So it's kind of nice, but not a big, big, big win like I'm looking for. So 
And in terms of loading, I would, yeah, I'm glad that I prepared this beforehand, otherwise I would be uh, devastated by now. So you're seeing sequential JPEGs loading on top and progressive JPEGs loading at the bottom. You can see the window blind effect on top and you can see the popping up of progressive JPEGs in the bottom. All right, so now we've tested prog progressive versus sequential, the window blind effect versus the pixelated getting better option. Now let's see how much better we would do if we were running progressive JPEGs versus these five scan layers that I've now labeled optimized progressive JPEGs. And here's the test result for that. And here we see that um, the speed index is again a little better, but still no huge win, still no cigar. I kind of, was kind of hoping that optimized progressive JPEGs would already show some huge improvement here on HTTP 1, but they don't. Well, kind of, but not really. The visual graph, again, you can see that they're doing a little better sometimes, but not all the time. And the video again. So this is 10 scan layers on the left versus five scan layers on the right, all still on HTTP 1. So this is all the traditional way of how we've loaded images. Right hand side is now visually done. And now the image quality just gets better and better and better because they're progressive. All right, now that was all super, super old technique because HTTP 1. Now let's see how this is doing on HTTP 2. So we're gonna be using to do, do, we're gonna be using my web server. I'm happy that the SSH connection is stable. And we're gonna go into the website that I just showed you and we're gonna be using a uh, HTTP2 web server called Caddy. Um, Caddy is written in Go, I really like it, it's simple, it's clean, it works really well. It's not significantly better or worse than any other web server. What Caddy does really nicely is it integrates Let's Encrypt so it gives you your certificates quite quickly. So that's not a, it's not the big reason to use Caddy but I'm lazy, so. Um, for Caddy to run, we need the Caddy file which basically just defines how Caddy works. And um, I'm currently just telling Caddy that I want to use a self-signed certificate and that it's not supposed to, uh, to be caching anything because I want to make sure that I don't botch my tests. This is all that I'm doing here. So now I'm running Caddy. And I should be able to access the websites over HTTP2 now. Yep, hopefully this works. Tip. Ah, yeah, of course. I have, a I have a certificate error, but that's okay. All right, yes, it's loading. Excellent. So that means Caddy is now serving me HTTP2 enabled data on my own server. And now I'm gonna put this into web page test. So, where are we? There we are. All right, cable three, yes, all good, go. Huh? Come again? Oh, I haven't set that flag, have I? Thank you. Yeah, okay. All right, so this one is running, that's good. And we're gonna compare sequential to baseline progressive, sorry, to uh, progressive JPEGs over HTTP2. And ignore that. So what I'm looking for here is to find out if sequential JPEGs are already acceptable on HTTP2. Or so if I even need to bother with progressive encoding. And that's why I'm comparing sequential to progressive, to default progressive on HTTP 2 now. 
Come on, web page test. I was kind of hoping this would be faster. Here we go. First run. Here we now see that nice effect of multiplexing, that all the requests to uh, all the JPEGs have started in the same time. And we can already see in the table that my speed index is a little better now, but still not great. And this is how progressive JPEGs hold up. Wow, this is even better than I expected. Look at that. Look at that speed index. And maybe I can now finally get a comparison video live for you. So this one versus this one. And here's that visual graph that I've been wanting to show you. This is progressive JPEGs versus sequential JPEGs on HTTP2. And the reason for the huge win that we see here is that HTTP2 with its multiplexing ships all the first scan layers that we've been seeing uh, in one go. Therefore, the speed index is much, much higher because now users who are, uh, who are loading our website will see a lot of images or a lot of image previews sooner. And the browser knows about the size of the images sooner, which, make, which makes it easier for the browser to lay out the page. This is why that visual process, progress graph for the progressive JPEGs is much, much better than for the sequential JPEGs on HTTP2. So all those scan layers get delivered faster, sooner to uh, via HTTP2. And this is, uh, again, in case I didn't manage to get WebHS to run, we can see the same result here. And the visual graph, we can skip that now. And now I already mentioned that we need to make sure that in comparison to HTTP 1, our congestion window is OK. And for that, I just want to show you how to test your congestion window and maybe how to change it. So let me kill Caddy here. And with IP route show, I can get information over my network interfaces and what's happening here. And the important line here is default because with default, I'm setting my, uh, my initial congestion window to the right interface. So it says default, the IP ETH0, ETH and the initial congestion window, which is currently set on 25. Why is it set on 25? Because I've calculated it for my tests, this is supposed to be good. Here's a formula of how to calculate the initial congestion window. So it's basically megabytes per second multiplied by the round trip times divided by the bytes per package. That should give you the initial congestion window. Then below that, I've given you the example for, six, for a six Mbit connection. And um, I've, I've also assumed that I have a 50 millisecond round trip time, which is represented by my 0 0.050 in the formula. And that ends up with telling me that I need a bytes per package of 0.025. And that means an initial congestion window of 25. Now, this is only true um, for, initial, for HTTP 2. If I used an initial congestion window on, of, of 25 on HTTP 1, this might be far too big. I might actually run into performance uh, issues because of that. But because HTTP 2 only has that single stream, I need a bigger initial congestion window. So I don't know if you remember, but for HTTP 1, the initial congestion window was supposed to be 10. Should be a good initial congestion window. But of course, it depends on your, the average amount of connections that your browsers, uh, that your users' browsers make, and um, what kind of bandwidth they have available. Let's see. Yeah. So I've now double-checked that my... Um, that my initial congestion window on my server is currently set at 25. Let's say I want to change that. I would do it like this. So I need sudo because I'm changing something about my network interfaces. Um, and then I have, to put the, I have to pick the right IP in the right network interface. And then at the very end, I can define a new initial congestion window for this network interface. Now for argument's sake, I'm going to set it back to 10 to make it more optimal for HTTP 1 delivery. So it's now going to ask me for my sudo, can, uh, for my root can, uh, password, and I'm happy that, oh, I mistyped. I'm happy that you can't see that. And here we go. I've now run e IP route 
uh, again, and now my initial congestion window is set on 10 for that interface. Now, if I would do initial, con initial congestion window phased tests for HTTP 1, HTTP 1 would look better. But since I want to make sure that HTTP 2 is actually just as fast as HTTP 1, I should be setting it back to my 25 because that's the kind of uh, window I need for the tests that I'm showing you today. So now I've set it back. So this is how you would do initial congestion window tuning manually. But you should, of course, think about automating this, which you can. All right. So that's sequential versus baseline. Yep, all right. So let me sum up what I've shown you so far, because all of that has been the basis, basically the basics. So I've talked to you about what progressive JPEGs are, what they're made up of, so scan layers, and um, that they benefit immensely on HTTP2 because of HTTP2's multiplexing. The reason for this being that more of the initial scan layers can get shit simultaneously. That's basically what I've been talking about for the last, what is it now? 15 minutes, I think. And the funny thing is, that's actually all old news. It's such old news that it's now four years old, but nobody really remembers this, that somebody else found this old already. Um, John Meller from Google found, this, found stuff like this out when he was uh, experimenting with Speedy back in 2012. I think the only people who picked up on that were Andy Davies and Joaf Weiss, because they incorporated some of, his re some of uh, John's research in their slide decks. But what John found out back in 2012 when HTTP2 wasn't completely defined yet and Speedy was still around, which was part of a predecessor of HTTP2, um, John found out that with only 15% of data sent, he could get the initial scan layers to ship if he used in, uh, progressively encoded images. And with 35%, um, a website using Speedy with progressive images already had good enough visuals that users were happy with it. This is something he found out four years ago. So by now, because it's so old, I ask myself, can, what can I do to make that thing go even faster? I mean, it's kind of nice that I know that default scan layers ship fast on HTTP2, but I wanted to create something that goes even faster. So I went back and played in that guts of progressive JPEG encoding and came up with that idea of the five scan layers that I showed you. So now let's see how those five scan layers do on HTTP2. I'm taking the, so where is it? Taking the baseline here. I'm keeping the test around because it's already HTTP2. And now I'm running this against a new file that I'm, oh, let's see if I can type this correctly, opjpeg tba, yes. So opjpeg tba um, is basically just a HTML file that references differently encoded JPEGs, namely the ones with five scan layers instead of the 10 scan layers. So that's what I'm testing now. I already have a, have a result for the default 10 scan layers here because that's already HTTP2. And now I'm hoping that I can get a good result for the five scan layers. And this is live demo again, so this is probably gonna fail. Let's wait and see. Okay, that's just odd. Ah. Yes, it's odd because I didn't start the web server. <laughs> All right, so let's wait for the result, but I can already tell you that this is what I got out when I tested this at home. So it worked on my machine. Um, progressive JPEGs with 10 scan layers have a significantly uh, worse speed index than the ones with five uh, scan layers. 
So I highlighted the differences in green and uh, red. So the 10 scan layer default progressive JPEGs are a little smaller because uh, the JPEG encoder is a little better at reducing information with 10 scan layers. So the bytes in total and the completion, the page load time are better on the default scan layers, but the speed index is much, much better if I use my method with five scan layers because I show significant information like color sooner. That's basically what's happening in the optimized progressive JPEG on HTTP2 result. And I'm kind of hoping that this, yes, well, a little. So live demo, not always sure that this actually works out. We see here the result for OP JPEG, so optimized progressive JPEGs with TBA, that's just my name. Um, and we see here that we now have a speed index of about 1200 versus the speed index of 1300. So not that significant right now, but uh, on average, I found out that this is a gain of 6% on speed index. So let's compare these two to each other. And here's the visual graph for that. So we see that the, um, that the baseline, that is the, uh, so that's the baseline is the 10 scan layers. They start off a little better. They start off a little better because the initial scan layer is a little smaller. But then the blue line overtakes uh, because to the left is always better from your perspective. And um, the reason being that after a certain amount, so about 25% here, the, um, progressive, the optimized progressive approach with only five scan layers shows more information to the user that is relevant, like color and detail, in uh, comparison to the default scan layers. This is the visual graph I got out when I tested this at home. It's kind of the same. So as you can see, baseline is doing a little better at the beginning, but then it gets overtaken by the five scan layer approach. So this is basically how this would look to a user. The first scan layer, remember how we cut them apart with JSK? The second, already okay. The third, the fourth, now the meadow is green, and then the fifth, we don't even see any change anymore. So this is why the speed index is even better on HTTP2, and like I said, my measurements have shown that the optimized progressive JPEG approach with five scan layers on HTTP2 yields about a 6% speed index gain median over the default encoding process. So now this all has been done on default HTTP2 settings. And um, Steve already mentioned that in the introduction. Server push is really what lots of people are looking for now to, uh, to solve a couple of the problems they've been facing with HTTP2. And I've only managed to complete these tests two days ago, I think. And I'm only do, able to do that on a very, very unstable web server, but I'm still gonna go ahead and show you that. So what I'm gonna try to attempt here is I'm gonna try to get HTTP2 to um, push the scan layers that we've created with, um, with our encoding sooner than the browser requests them. And what I'm gonna use for that is a web server called Shimmercat. Shimmercat is very, very, very beta. It's so beta, it's probably alpha. Um, Shimmercat is, is really unstable. Don't use it in production. It, they even say so on the website. Don't use it on production. Just use it for testing. And um, Shimmercat, while I'm using Shimmercat is, Shimmercat is the only HTTP2 enabled web server that enables me to define priorities, so server push priorities, for my separate scan layers. And what you can see here is how Shimmercat does this in their syntax. In the first line, you'll see that I've attempted to set priority to a maximum. Um, Shimmercat is using something they're calling, calling the calm value, so calm as in quiet. And that means um, the lower the calm, the more aggressive the server is to send something. So a calm index of zero means send this ASAP. And a calm index of, I think the value goes up to 255. A calm index of 255 means this is completely unimportant, send this whenever. This is the range of where, where we can deal with. And what also is important about the common index is that cumulative cascade, I've already mentioned that in a comment, um, each value that you can see in the very, very last comment line is added up to the values before. So that means that the um, first um, a bit of information has a priority of, uh, has a maximum priority. Then we have a priority addition of 100. 
and then 50, but that doesn't mean that the third layer has a priority of 50. It means that this third layer has a priority of 150. So each value gets added up. So that's the cascade of priorities that we see here. Now, let me attempt to live demo this. This is going to be really, really fun. Uh, we're going to kill Caddy on the live server, and we're going to go up one and going to have a look at Caddy's configuration file. And this is Caddy's configuration file for our demo site. And all I'm doing here is to tell it that where, where the root directory is, basically. That's all I'm doing here. And because I'm going to take a network interface, I have to sudo this again. And here we are, Caddy serving my demo website now, hopefully. And now we're going to be running tests against Caddy. I have to rerun um, one of our tests because if I compared, if I compared the OP JPEG approach now with what I'm going to um, test with server push, I would be comparing also Caddy web server with the Shimmercat web server, which I don't want to do. I want to compare Shimmercat versus Shimmercat, so I have to rerun one of the tests here because Shimmercat is going to do a little worse because it's not production ready. So, and don't forget this. Oh, ah, important. We have to switch to Firefox for this test too. We have to switch to Firefox for this test. I only found this out two days ago because Firefox is the only browser that implemented server site resource reprioritization in HTTP2, which means it's the only browser that supports an HTTP2 enabled web server to tell it what's important. Chrome, and Chrome has, this, uh, has partial support for this right now, but not full support. But I would need full support to show what this is able to do. So I'm switching to Firefox for my test. All right, now I'm preparing a test with the server push file. And the server push file is exactly the same as all the other test files. The only big difference, like I said, is the prioritization of assets in the, uh, in the get parameters of each, J of each JPEG call with the calm value. And as you can see here, I'm trying to tell um, the server that it should send all scan layers as soon as possible with the highest uh, uh, priority as possible. So the first zero sends the metadata, so not even any visual information. And then the second zero tells that all other scan layers are supposed to be sent with maximum priority. So this is what we're going to compare against. And again, Firefox and, yep. Yeah. So as you can see here, this is uh, just to bash Shimmercat a little. You can see here that Shimmercat isn't really production ready because you can see that we have a, a very long time to first byte depending on the assets. So Shimmercat is really just here so we can demo server push for, uh, for the uh, scan layers, but Shimmercat isn't production ready for any kind of serious work. So you can see by this waterfall graph. Oh, great. And of course, <laughs> and of course, it didn't work this time, probably because network. So here, currently live demo, the default scan layers actually went out a little, well, with 13 milliseconds about, um, to, the, uh, to the server push result. But let me show you what I've measured, if I measured a longer time and not just three tests. So here we see a couple of tests all run on Shimmercat. The last, the one that I try, just try to live demo is test number three against test number four. So first of all, at the uh, top, you see Shimmercat delivering sequential JPEGs. Then you see Shimmercat delivering normal progressive JPEGs with 10 scan layers. Then you see Shimmercat shipping optimized progressive scan layers with only five. And then at the very, very bottom, you see five scan layers and optimized progressive JPEG, but this time supported by server push. 
And if you have a look at the speed indices, you will see that it goes lower and lower and lower. And this is also very, very nicely reflected in the visual graphs. Here you can see that the, uh, the sequential JPEGs and the normal, uh, so, no, sorry, the sequential JPEGs of course start off as early as possible because they're easiest for the, for, the, for the server to send and for the browser to start rendering, but they soon get overtaken about by, about by one third of, of all the image data, but all the other approaches that we've tried today, namely all the progressive in, in, approaches. But then, oh yeah, um, the standard progressive JPEGs uh, lose out. This, re, uh, this I also have to mention. The reason being that Firefox is in this test unable to do the window blind effect. So in these tests, Firefox is only able to either show or not show an image. So it has to wait for the full image to download and then the image suddenly pops up completely loaded. So this is why the, in this test, the sequential JPEGs actually win against standard progressive JPEGs. But after we've meddled with the progressive JPEG encoding, we can see in the yellow, the yellow bar over here, optimized progressive JPEGs already win against sequential and of course against the progressive with Firefox. This is something we've been showing, uh, we've, been, we've seen before. But now look at the green graph. The green graph here starts off as second best, then is as good as sequential, and then actually overtakes sequential in terms of being able to show significant information to the user sooner. And this is the four-way comparison, how this would look. So top left, you will, have, you will see sequential, top right, default, progressive, bottom left, optimized progressive with five scan layers, and bottom right, um, server push. And it's in slow motion, of course, so you can appreciate what's happening. S yeah. See how server push already has shown? Yeah, now server push is done. That's pretty neat. And we're still waiting and still waiting, and here we go, now everything's done. Yoo -hoo. So I hope that I'm, yeah, I incorporated this too to uh, show you what's actually happening under the hood here. So sequential, J I don't know who, how many of you heard that progressive JPEGs have that problem with CPU time causing more CPU load on devices. You can actually see that in the very right hand graph. There's the CPU busy time. And you can see that all progressive decoding approaches take up more CPU time than the sequential. But on the other hand, we have a much, much better user experience. So this is actually something that I wouldn't call significant anymore, especially with powerful mobile devices. Even Apple have switched to supporting progressive JPEGs. So we're kind of safe with that. So now if you look at the, if the T2, uh, sorry, three different CPU spikes for progressive JPEGs, you'll see that the normal 10 scan layers cause the most, the most CPU load. The five scan layers are a little better, but server push is actually the best for that. The reason being because the uh, information in, uh, needed for a browser to lay out the page gets there even sooner and has to do less repaints. So the browser is able to display the same page with less work in comparison to the other ones because the server is now sending lots of information that the browser needs to lay out these pictures sooner. All right, let's see if I could show that in these tests too, but probably not. So push and let's compare them. Yeah, just a little. We can only see that a little here. So yeah, in this, in this uh, demo, in this live demo, the result wasn't as clear, but that's just live demo, sadly. I kind of wish this would have worked out better. All right. Um, so that's server push. And now I'm ready for takeaways. Um, before I head into the takeaways, are there any questions about server push? Because it's basically the newest bleeding edge stuff that we can, that we can do right now. Has anybody, uh, has anybody not understood what server push is doing here? Michael. So this is a test web page with just images on it. Yeah. In a real live website with CSS, JavaScript, and that, would you still recommend pushing the first layer of maybe your single variable or something like that? Because I've done some tests where if you push too much, mm -hmm. it's slow the whole page down. Yep. So the question is, would I recommend this for a live web page, which is, of course, more uh, diverse than my academic test web page, which only contains 20 JPEGs and nothing else. 
And the answer is um, no. What you should probably consider is pushing the metadata, like Shimmercat is enabling you to do with the very first scan layer. Push that with a high priority, but then create a cascade like I've shown in the code demo with 150, 25, because that would enable a browser to already know about the dimensions of an image without actually getting any image data, so the metadata. Then the browser is able to lay out the page soon. Then we, the initial scan layer should get a priority. 100 isn't a bad value here. Maybe 80 would be nicer. Then the initial scan layer is starting to render, but then the other scan layers can get a lower priority. Um, Michael mentioned rightly that if we gave everything priority, of course, ev no nothing can really work, right? If everything's important, nothing's important. So we can't give, uh, we can't give scan layer, all scan layers the same importance in the live website. You would have to decide what's important. And with, if, you, if you have a server that uh, does the get parameter approach, you could even do this per image. You would, of course, have to change your markup but you could do this per image. You could say the hero image really is very important for our conversion. Unlikely, but maybe that's the case. And then you can, you can set the get parameters in there. If, um, if you find out that uh, other images are not as important, you can prioritize, you can deprioritize them. So this is of course a question of how your, how your website is set up. Okay, right. So if there are no more questions, takeaways. Number one, I hope that I managed to show you that progressive JPEGs and HTTP2 are a huge win. So the, the, inter, the, the interplay, is that a word? Yeah, the interplay between these two is really, really nice because of the scan layers that get shipped simultaneously due to HTTP2's multiplexing. So that's a big win for us. And scan layer manipulation, which I've been dabbling with for the last couple of months, gives us a better speed index, depending on what kinds of images you're using. So JPEGs, definitely you can manipulate the, the, um, the scan layers, but even PNGs benefit from this. The only problem with PNGs is that we can't influence the scan layers as much. So PNGs get their scan layers created by an algorithm that's called Atom7, and we can't really change that around. While with um, JPEG, we, like I showed you with the script, we actually have a chance to take more granular control over what's being shipped per scan layer. And if you do that, if you create this granular control, you can, you can create a better speed index for your users, which means they think the site is loading quicker or has the, they have the feeling the site is loading quicker because relevant information inside the images is shipped sooner. And then, last but not least, HTTP2's server push enables us to push information even if the browser thinks that things, other things should be important. So a little anecdote about this. Um, every browser currently that supports HTTP2 has different ideas about what is important. So that priority graph for Firefox looks different from the priority graph for Chrome. And um, like I said, uh, browsers need to support the reprioritization that server side can do. And only Firefox is currently able to do this, but we're getting there and other browsers are picking this up. But, um, so, as if, so for the test case I've shown you today with Firefox, we can already see that the optimized scan layer approach really benefits if we enhance it with server push, because we can get those initial scan layers that create the better speed index out even sooner, even sooner than with the normal multiplexing approach. And that is awesome source. So that's me. Thank you very much. I'm now open for questions and uh, throwing things at me. And uh, yeah, my, again, my Twitter handle, email, and please provide feedback for all of this. Okay, questions, go ahead. Hi. And uh, it looked like that was a client-side thing that you did. Was, I mean, it looked like you were, you were tuning the, the congestion window on. Oh, I see. On your no, I was doing that. I was doing that with an SSH session on my server. Sorry, I should have mentioned that. Right, that's a really good point. So the question is, did I actually just tune my initial congestion window on my client to make this, to make these checks? And no, uh, that's my fault. I should have mentioned that. I was connecting via SSH to my server and changing my server's network settings. Thank you. Yes. Yes. Changes to the initial congestion window have to be done on the Ethernet device level. Um, like if, it's, if an image is 
So the question is, do browsers skip scan layer painting if they get sufficient data in, in, a, in a significant amount of time? And the answer is no, they don't skip it. At least as far as all my tests I've seen so far are concerned. So yeah, you would to see every scan, exactly. But it's happening so fast, um, you, the human eye wouldn't pick that up. Pardon? Oh, I see. Um, so the question is, uh, would server push overwrite the browser cache? So if something is already cached, would server push still push that b over the wire? No. Hopefully, if a browser is implemented properly, it will find out that the asset is already available in cache and prioritize that over what the server is doing. So um, I, I'd, I'd consider every browser that doesn't do that as broken, I guess. And I haven't seen any browser that does that this way so far. Yes, but the only, the only thing, oh, sorry, sorry, I have to repeat the question. Um, so can we apply the same techniques to the PNG images? And the answer is a yes, but we cannot influence the scan layer creation process. PNGs have this hard-coded way of creating the, in, the internals of their scan layers by using Atom7, and we cannot influence them as nicely as we can do with a scans file on JPEG. Michael, you were getting frustrated down there with all your hands. Uh, oh. oh, okay. Dean. Yes. So the question is, uh, is there any other way to do server push aside from the query strings that I've shown you today? Um, yes, there is. Um, the only uh, reason why I did this today is A, because I needed to find a web server that easily supports server push, and especially concerning separate scan layers, because all, not all servers, not all HTTP2 servers that currently support server push, support server push per scan layer. And uh, I didn't want to write my own, so I took one that was already there. And the nice additional benefit is it was visual. So I, I could show you that on the command line very easily, so that's the reason why I chose this. PNG quant. <laughs> so sorry, I, I'm going to repeat this well. So what's the what's the best encoder uh, for for PNGs? If Mods JPEG is the best one for JPEGs, which one is the best for PNGs? According to the tests I've seen and the tests I've run, it's PNG quant currently. So actually, it's called PNG quant two by maintained or by until others by Conor Lezinski. It's really really good. It can do stuff, for example, like. Um, dithering of gradients that no other PNG encoder can do. So actually, PNG quant is able to do lossy PNG encoding, which makes PNGs really, really small. That's, yes, quant, like quantifier. Yeah, exactly. You're welcome. Oh, hi. So the question is, can we do um, prioritization with server push on other assets? And the answer is yes, of course. Uh, it's actually there for this. So my hijacking this technology for image delivery is actually kind of a edge case. It, the most common way to use this would probably to push um, CSS that hasn't been requested, for example. Or if, if you know that um, your users need a certain JavaScript file soon, you could prioritize that differently. So, you can prioritize any kind of asset you can deliver. So I acoustically didn't get all of it. I think I got a little bit of it, but not all of it. Could you repeat? So do you mean is there a, is there a way so that we can optimize image compression if the image has already been pre-compressed? Yeah. On the optimization, so if that technique applies to having the original image. Yeah. But it, and it tries to take that to the objective layer of saying, hey, 1.5%, that's generally good. 
Yep. If you don't have the original image, you can't use that as a standard. So I was just curious if you thought about that. Yep. No, that's a, that's a very good point. So the question is, what do you do if the image is being delivered by, say, an external party or another team and maybe has been pre-compressed? And then maybe if you recompress it, the quality gets really bad. That's a very good point. And the answer is, uh, yeah, that's a problem. And there are algorithms out there that are, enable, that are enabling us to detect ringing artifacts present in an image. So we can already find out if an image that is supposed to be our master image for compression uh, already has too, too much lossiness in it, it doesn't look good enough anymore. We can find that out using, uh, using algorithms and detect these ringing artifacts. And uh, as a next step, what we could do is we could exclude those ringing artifacts from further compression. ModJPEG is gonna get a, um, a new feature which is called per block level lambda optimization soon. And this will enable us to define the quality per block level, so per eight by eight pixel block. And if we should use such an algorithm to find out that a certain area of high contrast already has these ringing artifacts, we could then say this area of ringing artifacts should only be treated with low compression so that the compression doesn't get worse. That would be a way to treat this. You're welcome. <laughs> Micah. All right, so the question is, how, how is that all do working with JPEG XR, WebP, and all the other pro, semi-proprietary formats out there? Um, I'm not sure if we can influence um, progressive encoding of WebP. I haven't even looked at it. Um, my, my terrible answer to this is I wouldn't invest support, the time to support these. Um, so, yeah, I know it's controversial. <laughs> the thing is, um, I am a strong believer in that JPEG is the only good image format that we need. Um, also, if you look at what, uh, what JPEG, uh, what the JPEG working group is currently working on, it's called something JPEG XT, JPEG extended, which will give JPEG, standard JPEG, much more features in the future. So I don't think that we should invest engineering time into supporting the attempts of other companies to solve the image formats problem with stuff like WebP or JPEG XR or what other proprietary format was out there. If you want to, I can spend some time with WebP. <laughs> Precisely. And um, I know that there was some work done by Tim Ebert, who spoke here before from Radware a couple of years ago, where she compared how customers actually respond to progressive JPEG versus basic <laughs> other formats. Yep. And um, found that in general, customers didn't respond as well to progressive JPEG. Have you seen other uh, studies or done anything yourself in that space? I've seen this study very closely. And I was astounded by, let me, posit, let me phrase it this way, I was very astounded by this study because it went against everything we've seen so far. So especially if you consider that uh, Pat Meeman, creative web page test, is a strong supporter of progressive JPEGs and that all the other information we've, we've seen so far is that progressive JPEGs are perceived better. So when Redware came out with this study, everybody in the image optimization community was very surprised. By now, we haven't seen a single Con corroborating second study that tells the same story. So we might ask ourselves if this study might not be an outlier. <laughs> if you want to, I can tell you more anecdotes about this uh, without a microphone. <laughs> you mentioned the one and a half percent for the SSIM. Yes, so yeah. So the question, the question is, what is that, that sweet spot of visual difference that we can perceive per, uh, for SSM and DSMM? And the, uh, the answer is that 1.5%. This is not re regarding um, which tool, um, but it's regarding how the human visual system hopefully is able to detect a difference versus not able to be detected a difference. And it's supposed to be about 1.5% visual difference. Um, a small anecdote to this. While DSSIM is currently the best tool that we have available right now, 
Google has just um, open sourced something called Butter Ugly. They always name everything after Swiss pastries, maybe because they're hungry. Um, and Butter Ugly is supposed to be a better replacement for DSSIM. It's supposed to be even closer to the human visual system. And I'm going to look into Butter Ugly very, very, very soon and try to find out if that's actually better. But even for Butter Ugly, we would still try to aim for a visual difference of maximum of 1.5%. So this is a consistent value. Go ahead. That's a very interesting question. Um, so the question is, uh, is there anything we have to deal with if we have transparency in PNG? And, uh, and uh, yes, um, the, the answer is I don't know. That's a very good question. And I should probably take that back to my desk and think about that for a good while. Um, I don't know. I think, yeah, probably, probably transparency creates another layer of complexity into this. And we, we, we might probably have to consider when to ship the transparency information, how important that is. Yeah, that's a very interesting question. Thank you. Well, I think that's it. Thank you very much. And yeah.